Hello and welcome to the essay. Today I am joined by Per Gender, Director for Nuclear Fuel at WMC. So Per, thanks so much for joining us here today. Thanks for having me on, Amy. It's, uh, it's great to be here. It's always great to be able to connect with people, even uh, virtually. But maybe we could just start with a bit of background into kind of your own professional experience and work with WMC. Sure. Uh, yeah, I, I've been in the nuclear industry for about 20 years now. So uh, I guess that's the absolute majority of my career. It certainly wasn't when I started out. I did uh, electricity trading for, for a couple of years to begin with, but then uh, basically didn't know much about nuclear energy. So I joined a Swedish uh, utility and one of their rotations was to go to a nuclear power station. And that was um, yeah about tw over 20 years ago now. And uh, I never left. So uh, so I've been at the Swedish utility, I've been at a Swiss utility, I've been at a trade association in London for a little bit on uh, to work on nuclear energy and, and climate change. And then majority of my career in the nuclear or nuclear fuel space has been with Cameco. So I think the, most people are familiar with the large Canadian uh, uranium miner. And then in 2019, I uh, joined three Dutch gentlemen and a good friend of mine uh, at WMC. And uh, we're sort of a Dutch commodity merchant that uh, started out the nuclear fuel only, but we have since expanded into battery metals and uh, and copper and other energy transition materials as well. So that's uh, that's where we are now, and we've grown from uh, about five in 2019 to to around 40 today. Amazing. And so, can you talk us through, you know, the connection of WMC with Sprott's Physical Uranium Trust? Uh, yes. So uh, Sprott took over their physical uranium trust from the predecessor UPC in 2021. And while Sprott are really good at running uh, physical commodity funds and trusts, they do that extremely well. They did not know anything about uh, nuclear fuel or the uranium market. So they basically needed a technical advisor. And that's when we got in touch with them. And uh, it was just a really good fit. I, I really enjoy working with them. It's basically 80% of my job is to, uh, to work with Sprott. And uh, and yeah, we got along really well, and it's been a fantastic partnership, and we we continue to work uh, very closely together every day. Technical advisor basically mean uh, well, apart from being uh, John's nerd on uh, on any uh, any meetings and uh, any panels he might be on, it also means that we manage the physical inventory of uranium that Sprott has, and we also buy any uh, any uranium. So we're over the three years it's been now, it's we bought about 50 million pounds almost. So it's uh, it certainly kept us busy for the first few years, and and hopefully we'll get there again. Uh, but it's uh, it's still quite a lot to do with all the uh, all the inventory that's uh, that's collected around the world. So that's essentially what we do. Okay, interesting. Sounds like a really kind of positive partnership between uh, between the two groups. And so uranium has been kind of a, a very you know, a big commodity of in general discussions at the moment. So we've got the growth of AI and data centers. Um, and, you know, the there's a huge amount of growth of clean energy that's needed to kind of fuel all of this. So what's your opinion on the overall outlook for uranium and the nuclear industry? Yeah, it's uh, it's it's extremely positive, I would say. Again, as like I said, I've worked in about it for 20 years and, and every interview when I get asked is like, how how does it look? And I keep saying it's getting better and better, but but it really is getting better and better. Uh, so it feels like that now that it's just like a snowball and it, it's really catching up speed. And uh, and well, we can touch on the announcements uh, last Friday from from the U.S. in a little bit here. But it's uh, it it really blows my mind. Like I said, uh, to, to, it's always been a struggle from time to time after the financial crisis. And then there was Fukushima and there's certainly been some some dark ages in this as well. Uh, but now it's really looking good. And I would say. AI is certainly part of the problem, uh, sorry, part of the solution or part of the story. Uh, but it's, uh, I, I would say even on its own, we like to say like this thesis looks so good on its own. So you don't really, that's icing on the cake. And it, it's a lot of icing that's potentially can be there too. But it's, uh, but it's sort of the, the need for electrification of society, the transition to clean energy. Uh, as we're looking at it today, unless you have large scale hydro assets in a country, um, nuclear is really the base load, the only clean 
source of energy that can provide base load for sort of the, the backbone of of any grid system and i think all we have to do is look about a month back what happened in spain when you have not enough spinning reserve um so and that you can really only get from big turbines uh turbines moving that has all that sort of momentum in it so even if the even if the power grid fails you still have that sort of kinetic energy in the system that can forgive a lot of uh um, a lot of sort of instability, but uh, when you don't have enough of that, then you get what happened in Spain uh, about a month ago. So I think society is also realizing that there is a technical aspect of this. I, I love renewables. It's great. We should have as much solar and wind as we can, but we have to realize where the limitations lie uh, and and construct our grids accordingly. So that story on its own it is very good for nuclear energy, I think. And then, of course, we also have now an almost an ex potential explosion of demand in with AI and it's always the theme for national security and and it's just uh, the energy demand uh, story is so big and so good that we're going to need pretty much everything of everything uh, and uh, so that's yeah that that's why I'd like to say like we don't have to stare ourselves blind at AI it, it's a very good story on its own but it certainly adds incredible momentum and also these companies while the utilities and nations can be a little slow from time to time. These large hyperscalers and tech companies, they really don't have time to sit around. They need data chips and they need electricity and they will make sure it happens one way or another. It's it stories like Microsoft and you know getting involved that really brings it into the common conversations um, in the general public. And so, you know, across different regions, there's a lot of, I would say, vastly different opinions on the role. Um, of that nuclear should play as part of the energy mix. So, um, you know, are you seeing more countries getting on board? Are there still some holdouts um, globally? Yeah, you can certainly see that it's a, a major shift in general. You've always had the big nuclear proponents, like France, for example, that's 80% of its energy electricity is coming from nuclear energy, and they've had an, well, they have an amazing fleet of nuclear power stations that that really create that stability that not only France, but the rest of Europe needs right now in order to, uh, yeah, to not have situation like we did in Spain. Um, so, so they have clearly been one of the big champions of nuclear energy. Uh, the U.S. has always been uh, been a big strong supporter as well. In the recent couple of decades, China is by far the leading star. If you have about 60 something plus uh, nuclear power stations being built around the world today, half of those are in China. And uh, and at this point, they built so many of them uh, that they're they're very good at it. It's basically just in, uh, in like a reflex movement. So they just eight to ten a year they just keep uh, keep pushing them out on time on budget and uh, that's exactly what a program should be like france did it in the 70s the chinese are doing it today and i think other countries are noticing they're seeing that i'm not saying that the german energy policy is completely failed but i would also say it's pretty close to so that like you realize that you can't do what the germans try to do uh and so a lot of countries are swinging around, and then it's like the the Belgians. They had a they had made a decision to phase out nuclear energy. They completely came around to 180. The South Koreans are certainly on their way to do the same thing, and uh, Spain. There is an interesting discussion going on. Uh, so a lot of countries are coming around. Kazakhstan, Uzbekistan are going to build for the first time, and it's it's pretty much all around the world. So regardless of where you were to the spectrum to begin with, it's all shifting in the same direction. I would say the one outlier is Germany, but even so, the current uh, the current the current biggest political party went into the election on the promise that we're going to look at restarting the nuclear power stations. Now they had to, in order to form the government, they had to be in coalition with the Social Democrats that were one of the main driving forces behind uh, the phase out of nuclear energy in Germany. And I think they don't think that that party can accept a restart. So that's the only thing that's stopping it in Germany, which is unfortunate, but it almost comes down to personal politics and they want to lose face. Uh, I'm not saying it's that simple, but in some cases it almost seems like it is. Uh, Taiwan is another good example where you have uh, one individual who is against nuclear energy and it certainly seems that the majority of the country is actually for it. So we'll just have to wait and see what happens, but only the way things have gone over the last couple of decades, it really is pretty much across the board is moving in only one direction. Absolutely. And I mean, as you mentioned earlier, um, you know, there's been some news out of the U.S. that uh, President Trump is also kind of fully backing 
uh, nuclear energy as well. Do you see yeah, that really was, moving uh, off there? Yeah, I mean, it was a, it was a very big announcement. I'm sorry, there's been sort of rumors about it for a little bit, and uh, but I think the the sheer ambition and size of it. Again, these are just executive orders, so they can obviously be reversed. Even though there is bipartisan support for nuclear energy, so these ones are not as likely to give, to become reversed. I think, but it is also these are very large decisions. So I think for for budget allocation and such things, it needs to be approved in the houses as well. But uh, but but still, it is uh, it's very very ambitious. I mean, I think when you had thirty three something countries uh, under the Biden administration when at these climate change negotiations uh, agreed to a tripling of nuclear by twenty fifty, in in true Trump fashion, you know Trump wants to be better than them. So now it's a quadrupling of nuclear energy until twenty fifty. So it certainly the U.S. realizes that. They are not the leading force of nuclear energy. They certainly were once upon a time. They're not anymore. China is on track to surpass them very rapidly here in, the, in a few years' time when it comes to being the, the largest nuclear nation. And I think they that's the situation they, seem, quite frankly, just don't want to be in. So uh, so they are firing up on all cylinders. The court, at, at least if they are going to make real, make uh, not make real, but make all these promises happen, then uh, the, the the nuclear fuel chain is gonna get uh, gonna get beefed up, and then reactors are gonna get licensed faster, and they're gonna have a bunch of reactors already under construction by 2030. So it's a uh, it, it's a uh, it's a very ambitious uh, goal they have set out, but uh, but I think the uh, yeah the resolve is there, and and obviously I don't think we need to look very far back in history that when the U.S. puts all its efforts behind something, it's uh, it's quite amazing what they can achieve. So it's uh, it'll be very interesting to see for sure. Absolutely. And so looking at, you know, there's such a, a growth in um, demand for nuclear energy. How does that relate to kind of the production of or the production of uranium? So is there kind of interest in investing into um, this industry? Um, I would certainly say so. I mean, it's uh, it's like it tends to be like yeah, there was certainly dark ages in and I for the in demand for for not only uranium but conversion and enrichment, so the entire fuel cycle. But I think the commodity itself is the simplest thing to invest in, uh, and certainly the the most options to invest in anyway. So if we focus on uranium alone, um, there is there is a need for it, and and one of the good things with with nuclear energy, I think as well, is that the predictability of it. Like once you build a nuclear power station. There is no substitute for the fuel. You have to have uranium for it. And most of these stations, even though they were designed for maybe 40 years, you start running tests on them and you realize that this thing is pretty much in a state as new. So you might replace a turbine or some steam generators, uh, but still you can operate it for 60 years. You now you have 80 years and some of them are even talking about 100 years. So this demand, once it's built, it's there. It's not going anywhere. And uh, and if you compare to, a, say, a gas power station where the, your operating costs, uh, that 70 percent of those operating costs are the fuel. So if gas doubles or triples in, pli- in, in price, that's going to affect your bottom line and your operating parameters. So you might sort of scale back or even shut it down. Now, with nuclear energy that or with uranium for nuclear energy, that number is five to 10 percent. So even if uranium prices go up, you are not going to shut that station down. You're going to keep operating it. So the price elasticity depending is not very big at all. The demand is going to be there. So now when we have such a strong looking demand side of the equation, the supply needs to follow. And the problem there is not very quick to ramp up. It takes time to build uh, to build uh, nuclear mines, I think, or sorry, uranium mines. All we have to look at is uh, like in Saskatchewan or in uh, in, uh, in northern uh, northern Canada, where at the Basket Basin, where you have some of the best assets in the world, but the licensing is taking a very long time. I think both NextGen and Denison are very good examples of that. Uh, even though Canada has said that we are going to start looking at potentially speeding this thing up, just like uh, the U.S. is announcing as well. So I think they are realizing that this could be a problem and we can't afford to have a bottleneck on nuclear fuel. So I think the uranium is certainly there. It can get out of the ground. Uh, it will, it's more a matter of at what price. And I think that we've already seen indication of uh, where price is sitting today. Uh, you have an Australian miner, Deep Yellow, who already announced that we're not advancing our project at these prices. They need to be higher than what they are. So I think that's an that's an indication of what we need to see to incentivize the new, these new mines to come online. Absolutely. All right. And so, you know, just to kind of wrap it up, any thoughts or, you know, 
key opportunities for those that are maybe looking to get involved either on the uranium or kind of down the line, the nuclear part of the industry? I, yeah, like because it's a uh, it's a very small space. Uh, I think that a completely uh, the complete market cap of all listed companies that are investable is about fifty billion. Maybe now up a bit, sixty billion after the big rise there after the U.S. announcement. But it's still a very small universe. So I don't think there is a lot of surprises uh, that uh, that can come out come out of it. But and of course you just have to. Junior miners are risky, but there is also a big return potential. So on the one aspect, you have the junior miners who are still maybe exploration companies. And on the other side, you have much more stable companies like a Kamnico or even a Sprout a Physical Uranium Trust where I work, where there is no mining risk. To, uh, the uranium is already out of the ground. But, uh, but of course, that moves in lockstep with uranium prices itself. So you don't have the multiple maybe you're looking at on a junior miner. But you can also step out and look at uh, the reactor vendors themselves. So Westinghouse is obviously part of Chemical, so you get some exposure to that. Uh, but even a Constellation uh, or uh, or a Nextera or a Vistra, that's good U.S. utilities that have significant nuclear assets. So the universe is of investment opportunities in, in the nuclear energy space is uh, is fairly big and is growing as well. So it's, uh, it's certainly worth, uh, worth keeping an eye on. Absolutely. Um, well, that sounds like a, a good place to kind of wrap it up, but I want to thank you for joining us here today at the assay, and uh, we'll definitely have to check back in, see, you know, how permitting is going, how, you know, just pricing and everything uh, for the industry moving forward. So thank you. Thanks a lot for having me on, Amy. I'm, uh, I'm happy to come back anytime.